Sometimes I like to tell stories. So I'm going to tell a story about a scientist, and he went upon an exploration. He spoke with his peers, and he was to find evidence of an ancient civilization in a certain area of the world. And so he came to that place. It was like a jungle. And he was to find evidence that there was once an ancient civilization in that place. There was some skepticism about it. Questions were being asked. People wanted to know, did an ancient civilization exist in such and such a jungle? It doesn't matter where it was, just a story. And so the scientist went there and he went exploring to find evidence that an ancient civilization had existed in this location, in this jungle. And so he went there and he was exploring. And so as he explored, he didn't see anything unusual. He saw a lot of animals and trees, and he observed these things, and he appreciated beautiful flowers. But then he came to a certain location in the jungle where it looked like the trees had been cleared away. And so there was a circular pattern of trees that had been cleared away, just a, a patch, a, almost a perfect circle where the trees had been cleared away. And in the middle of that perfect circle, there was what appeared to be a stone altar, also itself a circle, a stone altar. Perhaps it could have been used for rituals, ancient rituals. Looked like it had been designed. But when the scientists looked at that stone altar that was, a, was almost a perfect circle, a table, and when he had observed the trees that looked like they had been cleared away, he said, wow, this is a great testimony to evolution. Look at how the, the wind and the rain probably over millions of years just sort of blew these trees out of the way and formed a perfect circular patch. And look at that table, that stone table. It looks as though it had been carved. It looks as though it had been designed. But it must be the result of millions of years of wind and rain just somehow formed that table. Wow, what a wonderful testimony to the power of evolution. But I got to keep looking and see if I could find some evidence that there was an ancient civilization here. And so he continued to explore, and he wandered a bit further. And then he came across some stones that looked like they had been sharpened in a certain way. They looked like axes. All of them looked the same way. They were shaped like axes, ancient and primitive axes used for cutting. And even knives, primitive, kni primitive knives made of stone. They looked as though they had been carved and made to appear that way. But when he looked at those stones and those axes, he said, wow, what a, again, a wonderful testimony to evolution. These stones, somehow the wind and the rain blew on them. And over a process of time, they just by chance look like axes and knives, somehow by chance. Well, I have found yet another example, another testament to evolution. But still, I need to go a little further to see if I could find some evidence that there was an ancient civilization here, that if I could find that. And then he continued to explore further, and then he came to a clearing. And there in the midst of a clearing was a great statue, a statue that appeared to be a man seated in clothing in great detail. Oh, surely this must be the evidence. And he looked at that wonderful statue, and he said to himself, wow, this is it. This really proves evolution is true. That over millions of years of wind, rain, and natural process and chance, we could get this appearance of design in such detail. What a great testimony to evolution and the power of chance processes. What a great testimony. I wish I could have found some evidence of an ancient civilization, but instead I found great evidences of evolution and chance and time. And so when he finally came back to America and he met with his peers, and they said, what did you find, Dr. Jones? What did you find? And he said, I did not find ev any evidence at all uh, of an ancient civilization, but I found great evidences of evolution.
And they said, what do you mean? I found some things that could really help the cause of evolution, just drop dead evidence that it's true. And so he showed them the picture of the clearing with the table. And then he showed them the picture of the, the stone axes and, and primitive knives. And they were looking at each other like, what is he talking about? And then finally he showed the picture of the statue and he said, this clearly evidence of the power of evolution to create the appearance of design. And so I'm sorry I didn't find any evidence of an ancient civilization, but didn't I do a lot to further the cause of evolution? And they looked at each other like, what is he talking about? Now that's the story I have to tell. And you know, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans 120, let's turn in our Bibles to the book now that, that sounds like a, a funny story, but in many ways, in many ways, if we took the logic and the leaps of logic, and I dare say the leaps of faith, the, the leaps of faith that are necessary to believe in evolution, and if we applied them to other things, what that scientist, that made up fictional character in the story I told, do not seem that far-fetched. If you take the same logic that people use when looking at creation and you apply it to other things. It's very interesting that we live in a world where many learned people would have no problem identifying design if that design is originated from man. But when they look at nature and, for example, look at the feathers of a peacock, look at those beautiful patterns, or when they look at a human eye, or when they look at the hand. Nature is replete with design and they don't recognize that, but they have no problem recognizing design when it comes to things that man has made. So in the story, I sort of took that logic and applied it to things that man has made. And so the scientists obviously drew erroneous conclusions, but those conclusions are just as silly as the conclusions that are made when people look at the natural world and they say that's just a result of chance and time and mindless processes. Let us consider the book of Romans in the Bible. Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 1, and I'm going to verse 20. Romans, chapter 1, and verse 20. And here we see the word of God says... For since the creation of the world, his, meaning God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are what? That are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, meaning people are without excuse, that the evidence of the creator is evident in the design that is apparent in creation. Today I'm continuing with my series, Back to the Basics, and today I'm dealing with the sixth fundamental belief. So the first fundamental belief of the Adventist church is the scripture, the scripture being the authority of God. The second fundamental belief we dealt with was the Trinity. The third fundamental belief we dealt with was the Father, the Fourth, the Son, the Fifth, the Holy Spirit. Today we're dealing with creation and here is what the fundamental belief states. God is creator of all things and has revealed in Scripture the authentic account of his creative activity. In six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and all living things upon the earth, and rested on the seventh day of the week. Thus he established the Sabbath as a perpetual memorial of his completed creative work. The first man and woman were made in the image of God as the crowning work of creation, given dominion over the world, and charged with responsibility to care for it. When the world was finished, it was very good, declaring the glory of God. And so that is the sixth fundamental belief that we are dealing with now, creation and the evidence of creation, and that God is the creator 
The Bible tells us very clearly if we read in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and chapter 2, that God created everything in six days. Not only does it say that, but it reveals the meaning of the word day. The Hebrew word day is yam, yam. And so when the Bible says in the e then there was evening and then there was morning the first day, and then there was evening and there was morning the second day. So you have evening, morning, number, day. Evening, morning, number, day. And so the Bible is doing, God is doing everything possible to show you this. These are literal days. And then we have the Sabbath commandment in Exodus chapter 20 from 8 to 11 that tells us in six days God created what? The heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of water. That God created the way that he said he created. And so we keep the Sabbath because we believe that God created in six days and we rest on the Sabbath day. We don't rest every six million years. We don't rest every 6,000 years. So these days are literal days. They don't represent epic periods of time. That's why we keep the Sabbath, just the way that God created. We also know in the Bible that creation is an end time issue. How do we know creation is an end time issue? What do, we, what do I mean by an end time issue? It is something that is relevant for believers to understand now in particular. Why? Because we understand that from the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 and 7. The first angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospels, says, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. And then it goes on to say, worship him that created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the what? Fountains of water, springs of water in some translation. Now it's very interesting that those words are ascribed to the first angel because those words worship him that created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of water are directly connected with the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is the only commandment that tells us that in six days God created what? The heavens, the earth, the sea. Isn't it interesting that they are directly connected to the first angel's message? It alludes to the fourth commandment. So it shows us that this is an end time issue. But there's another way we can understand that this is an end time issue. In the year 1844, which for Adventists, I, I hope still, has a deep significance, the year 1844, prophetic for prophetic reasons. In the year 1844, it's very interesting that Darwin wrote his sketch for Origin of the Species. Isn't that interesting that that happened in 1844? And ideas about creation and questioning the biblical account of creation on a scientific level started right around that period of time. Isn't that interesting? That right around the period of time during the Millerite movement and when these things started, when prophecy started unfolding and the understanding of scripture started to deepen in the area of prophecy in ways that were very important, especially for the Adventist movement, that right around that period of time, we have Darwin's Origin of the Species coming out. Isn't that interesting? So the Bible is showing us this is an end time issue. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in the book of Psalms 11 and verse 3, if the foundation be removed, what can the righteous do? So it is not a coincidence that the foundation of creation in the minds of many believers has been removed. Why has it been removed? Because instead of trusting God's word, we decided to trust in man's interpretations. We decided to what? Trust in man's interpretation. Now, are human beings limited? Is there any human being that knows everything? Is there any scientist that knows everything? Science is constantly changing. Paradigms are shifting. Ideas are changing. 20 years ago, a scientist might say this. 20 years later, he might say that. But God doesn't change. In the book of Job 38.4, very important verse, Job 
Let's turn to Job. Job had a lot of questions, and those who are familiar with the story of Job, it addresses really the issue of what, what do you do when bad things happen? To, what, 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 why do bad things happen to good people? Well, truth is, biblically, there is nobody good. No, none. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But Job was a righteous man according to the standard of faith. He was a man who was faithful to God. He tried to, to do the, what was right. He went through a lot of difficulties. He began questioning God. God, you're not just. But then we read in Job 38, well, finally the Lord speaks to Job. See, throughout Job, he was struggling with his friends who were trying to assess why bad things had happened to him. And they all gave answers, many of them erroneous and confused. There was some sense in some of the answers. I'm not going to say that his friends had nothing good to say. There was some truth in it. But in the end, they were missing the mark. And finally, God spoke to Job. So in Job 38, verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of, a, of the whirlwind, praise the Lord, and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And then verse 4, where were you when I did what? Laid the foundations of the earth. Now remember the passage I read in Psalm 11 verse 3, if the foundations be removed, what can the righteous do? Now no man can literally and objectively remove the foundations of the earth. No man can do that, but it can be done in the minds of people when people doubt God's word from the very foundation from the very beginning. But God asks Job, where were you when I laid down the foundations of the earth? And Ken Ham, one of the, the, the founder of a ministry called Answers in Genesis, a very interesting and, and I think important website, if you have the time, answersingenesis.org. Answers, it, it, it deals with scientists that believe in the biblical account of creation. And you can watch videos there and get a lot of information there on AnswersInGenesis.org. Now, you might not agree with everything, but for the basics, you'll find a lot of information that deals with scientific evidence for creation. Scientists who believe it. In many different areas of scientists. Now, Ken Ham used this verse, and I think in a, in a very important way, and I'm going to use it that way today. The question being asked in another way in Job 38, verse 4, is, were you there? Were you there, Job? Were you there when God laid down the foundation of the earth? Now, we live in a day where many scientists are convinced that things did not occur the way the Bible describes it. The question to ask them is, were you there? If you have a scientist who, who tells you, no, that, that's all a story, that's all a myth, ask them, were you there? <laughs> ask them that question. And they'll say, no, I wasn't. But you weren't there either. And you can say, yes, I wasn't there, but God was there. God was there. And they might say to you, well, how do you know that God's word is true? How do you know that, right? How do you know the word of God is true? And you could say, because God created in me a clean heart. God created in me a new heart. And that is a miracle that I can testify of personally. You don't know what I was before. And I can tell you personally that God has created, but let me, let me just caution you, you have to be born again to say that. <laughs> In other words, you have to have that new heart experience. So you can't use that argument if you haven't been born again. But praise the Lord, I can use that argument by the grace of God. I can testify that that is a miracle. That that is a miracle. And so the same God that created in me a clean heart is the same God that created the heavens and the earth. And if he could ch change my heart and change me from the inside out, then I don't have any problem trusting his word from the very first verse. You have to trust and obey. No man was there. No man was there. And we already know that no man is completely trustworthy. We've spoken about that in the past. We can't even trust ourselves. How many times have you let yourself down? How many times have you done things that you said you'd never do and you did them again and again? How many times have you struggled 
between your will and your lower passions so that you were led to sin against your logic. And how many people have done the same thing? Everyone. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no scientist that knows everything there is to know. Not even about one single field of science. Not even one single field. And so we are limited. Yes, out of all there is to know, how much do you know? Now, if you ask that question to a great scientist, if you ask that question to the atheist Richard Dawkins, and you say to him, how much of all there is to know do you know? Even the atheist Richard Dawkins would have to say, I don't know. Because you, you don't know, if you don't know how much there is to know, you cannot tell someone how much percentage of that you don't know. How much percentage of all there is to know do I know? 50%? 40%? You don't even know how much there is to know. So you can't even answer the question. And that shows you how limited man is. And so there are many who scoff at the idea. Let us turn in the Bible to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 and starting in verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 3 and starting in verse 4. So here we read... <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 3, and starting, where did I say? Verse 4. And saying, okay, no, I'm going to go back to verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking around to their own lusts. Now listen to how it mentions lusts. Now lust is really just a perversion of love. That's really what lust is. It's a perversion of love. It's a misdirected love. Whereas love is selfless, and you can read about love, where? Where can you read all about love? First Corinthians what? 13. So that describes what love is. Lust is the opposite of all that. So ultimately, lust is self-serving. But you really don't serve yourself, you hurt yourself. You think you're serving yourself. But listen to what it says. For knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. Now listen to how it says that. And then after that, it says in verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. You see? But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, this is very interesting because it's talking about creation, but it's also talking about the flood. And it's also talking about the flood in that it's referring to the judgment of God. See, what is one of the reasons at the heart? We just saw lusts, right, in verse 3, walking according to their own lusts. Ultimately, what drives every false philosophy? Lust. Self. The desire to serve self, the desire to exalt man, what, what, what drives every false philosophy? What would cause somebody to not trust the word of God and rather to trust the word of man? What would cause someone to want to undermine the word of God? Because they don't want to be judged by God. They don't want God's judgment. They don't want God's judgment. When you understand that the world was created as it is said in Scripture, and you understand that there was a global flood as is stated in Scripture, and you understand that there is a judgment to come, you understand that you are subject to who? God's judgment. And so ultimately, what would drive a person to say, well, I want to be liberated of that? The desire to be your own God. The desire to be your own God. And so it's not a coincidence that we see this reference to the flood and God's judgment, and then we think of the first angel's message. Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his what? 
Judgment has come and worship him that what? Created the way he said he created. That's another way to say it. He created the way he said he created. So you have to take the Bible as a full unit. You can't say, I like this part, but I don't like that. I want to believe Jesus saved me, but I don't really need to believe in creation. Well, if you don't believe in creation, if you, you, you understand, and again, I got to credit, I got to give credit where it's due. It was, again, this man, Ken Ham, that brought that out in a very succinct way, a very clear way. Every major doctrine of scripture is tied up in those first 11 chapters of Genesis. Every major doctrine why did Jesus have to die for us? Because death is the result of sin. Because Adam and Eve died. Death came into the world because they had sinned. Because there was a literal garden, a literal Adam, a literal Eve, a literal fall, and that's why Jesus was the second Adam. See, if you undermine the beginning, if you undermine creation, you've undermined the whole gospel. You've undermined the whole gospel. If you say, well, I want to believe, and there are those that want to say that. I, well, I, I believe Jesus loved us. Uh, yes, he, and how did he demonstrate his love for you? He died for us, and why did he have to die for you? Because of sin. What is sin? Now, if you undermine the first chapters of Genesis, you don't even, can't even define what sin is. And that's why there's so much nonsense in churches today. That's why there's so much nonsense. Because people want to sound smart. By trusting in man who they know is limited. Now, is that smart? You already know how limited man is. You already know man can't be trusted. And yet you want to sound smart. You just really want to get along with people. That's really what you want to do. You want to be politically correct. It's not politically correct to say that you believe in six literal days creation. It's not. If you're a scientist and you say that, you can lose your job. There's a very interesting documentary that came out in the theater not too long ago, it was called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Has anyone heard of that documentary? Expelled, some might have heard of it. Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. That the man that hosted doc that documentary, what was his name? He was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the teacher. The, the, the teacher kept saying, uh, calling the name of, I forgot the name, but he was the one that hosted that documentary. And the documentary was about scientists that questioned evolution. They may have not even necessarily believed in six-day creation, but they just simply questioned evolution. And many of them lost their jobs, and they were interviewed in that documentary. They lost their jobs. It's not scientific. Do you realize that the father of the MRI, Raymond Damadium, was a six-day creationist? And yet he didn't get any credit for that. He didn't get any credit. Raymond Damadium. You hear, you hear other people that were involved with that, but Raymond Damadium, a six-day creationist, we don't hear much about that. So we can see that standing on the principles revealed in God's word, I actually had the pleasure, my wife and I had the pleasure of meet, meeting Raymond Damadian not too long ago. And so there's a danger in standing up for God's word because the wisdom of man is foolishness, but people think they're wise. You see, that's why it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See, a lot of people who think they're smart, they become less humble because they think they're smart. It should be that the more you learn, the more humble you become. Because if we truly approach creation and all of these things with a humble heart, we will become awed by what we see in creation, and it will raise more questions. Now, this is a book called In Six Days. In Six Days, you can probably get this in the ABC, uh, by Dr. John F. Ashton. It's a compilation of many different scientists in different areas of science that believe in biblical creation. Now, over here, I'm going to read from one of these scientists, and it says here, it may not, it may not be possible to predict precisely what will happen when species are removed from an ecosystem. Okay? But we know an effect of some kind is certain. What has already been discovered, however, suggests that ecological relationships are essential. If biodiversity 
is as necessary for normal ecosystem operation as appears to be the case, it suggests that these services and organisms providing them had to have been simultaneously present right from the beginning. In other words, what he's saying is that ecosystems are evidence of creation. He's saying in an ecosystem you have all these organisms, they're all interdependent on one another. If you believe in evolution that these things happen by chance over time, somehow you have to say all of them somehow evolved all at the same time, depending on one another, because you have to have all of them there. For one organism to exist, take a, a lion, right? Take a lion. For a lion to exist, you have to have the food that that lion eats, you have to have the conditions that that lion exists in, you have to have the, 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 the plant life that supports whatever other animals are there, and there's an interdependency. It's not just a lion alone. So you can't say, well, the lion alone evolved like this. You have to say all those other parts, all of those other things that make it possible for the lion to exist, all of them had to exist all together at the same time. That's called irreducibly complex. That's a way of saying it. Another book that deals with the issue of irreducible complexity was put, in, put together by a scientist named Michael Behe. Some have heard of this book, Darwin's Black Box. Anyone ever heard of this book? Darwin's Black Box. So this scientist, uh, again, was questioning the idea uh, of evolution, the idea of evolution. And he says here, the black box, the black box of the cell could not be opened without further technological improvements. In other words, what he describes as the black, black box, in other, let, let me read how he says it. Black box is a whimsical term for a device that does something, but whose inner workings are mysterious. Okay, you understand what a black box is? It's a device that does something, but its inner workings are what? Mysterious. Sometimes because the workings can't be seen, and sometimes because they just aren't comprehensible. And he's saying that when Darwin came up with his theory of evolution, the cell was his black box. He could have no way of knowing what was going on inside of the cell. Now the cell has been revealed, and it's another black box. Because within the cell, there's a series of irreducibly complex systems. The cell is like a factory. It is evidence of design. For example, DNA, the language of life. A highly improbable pattern and arrangement in DNA. Organized so it's like a blueprint for building proteins. Now how could all of that have evolved by chance? And you need to have DNA for a cell to reproduce and you need to have cells that reproduce to form life. You can't have life without a cell that can reproduce. You can't have a cell that can reproduce without DNA. But you can't have DNA without all these other things involved. Everything has to be. In, and these things cannot be explained by chance. But what often happens is that scientists, scientists use their imagination. And that's what Richard Dawkins does. He says, well, you, if you can imagine how it could happen that this, these things could have evolved, that's basically, basically what I understand is that if you could imagine it, if you could theorize it, that's good enough as proof. But that's not proof. There's no fossilized DNA, there's no fossilized primitive DNA, and we could say, well, look how this, no, there is none of that. So all of these things point to the evidence of God as the creator, creating the way that he said he did. Did God create the way he said he did? Yes. Now here's another point that is made connecting to what I just said. The parts could not evolve separately. Talking about the parts necessary, for example, to form one cell. To form one cell. This scientist says, the parts could not evolve separately and could not even exist independently for very long. In other words, they couldn't wait around millions of years for the other parts to evolve. They couldn't. Why? Why does he say? Because they would break down in the environment without protection. Even if they existed, the many parts needed for life 
could not sit idle waiting for the other parts to evolve because the existing ones would usually deteriorate based on what has been observed deteriorate very quickly from the effects of dehydration oxidation and the action of bacteria and other pathogens so it's impossible and it wouldn't make any sense I mean uh, uh, how would you Imagine somebody just over, imagine a, a monkey, right? Imagine a monkey that could never die, that could never die. Somehow it would live forever. And you put a keyboard in front of that monkey, and that monkey starts slapping on that keyboard. Would that monkey ever write a, a, a book? Even if he had millions and millions of years? I asked that question to somebody, and the person w was arguing with me, and he said, yes, it's possible. And I said, well, why is it possible? He said, because anything is possible. I should have said, if anything's possible, then it's possible that the Bible is true and you should surrender to God. But, <laughs> but at the same time, who says anything is possible? What proof do you have to say anything is possible? No, it's not possible that something like that can happen. It, it, it is not possible that you would have design without a designer. Or at least it's, it's not something that we've ever observed. Desi what, what's more reasonable? Yeah, you could say it's possible that I could walk out that door right now and a plane will fall out of the sky and kill me. But most of us would say that's probably not going to happen. Why would we stake everything on the possibility of something we don't even know is going to happen when what makes more sense is that design points to a designer and that there is a God? But what happens when we turn away from God? Let's go back to that passage in Romans. Well, we find out in Romans chapter 1 and verse 28, one of the things that happens is God gives people over to a reprobate mind. You see, if you continually harden your heart to the evidence of God as creator, you will be given over to a what? A reprobate mind mind a reprobate mind that's what it says in Romans 1 and verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a debased mind now back in verse 20 as we read before it tells us that the evidence of God is clear through the creation and no one has an excuse anybody can understand that there is a God by looking at creation. Even children, they just, it, it, see, even Richard, the atheist Richard Dawkins, even he testified that it just seems natural that children believe in God. You don't have to teach them, they just look at the trees, they look at things in nature, and they see evidence of design. That's just natural. And so when it says in Romans 1.20, there is no excuse for anyone not to believe in God, that applies to humanity as a whole, but it also applies to individuals. Every individual, every atheist out there at some point believed in God. At some point, because it's just natural. But what happens is, for some reason, we turn away from God. Let's read verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were what? Darkened professing to be wise, right? Like many people who deny creation today. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God. Instead of worshiping God, they began to worship man. See, it says they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the, an, the image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. In other words, they started worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Now, you could worship the forces of nature, which essentially is what evolutionist and material, materialistic naturalism is. It's really ascribing everything that you should ascribe to God and saying that's from nature. So you're worshiping nature or you're worshiping scientists who are very smart. These guys are smart. They must be right. That's worshiping man rather than God. Verse 24, therefore what happened? God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts. There you see the lust connection with these false philosophies. 
to dishonor their bodies among themselves. What's going on in the world today? What's being glorified in the highest courts of the land? Redefining what? This is something that all of you can see. Exactly what Romans is talking about. You see what I said in the beginning? Psalms 11 verse 3. If the foundations be removed, what can the righteous do? You see? And so we see the results in the world today. 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. The lie. And worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile what? Passions. For even their woman exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Remember that verse I read in Second Peter chapter 3, from 4 to 11, about people walking in their lust and denying the creation. You read this chapter, and it shows you the downward spiral of not trusting the word of God from its very first verse. Were you there? That's the question that we all has to ask. Were you there? No one was there except God. We already know we're not trustworthy. You already know you're not trustworthy. I already know I've let myself down. You know you've let yourself down. You know you're limited. I know I'm limited. We all have a thirst for righteousness. We have a need for someone to save us who is beyond humanity. Because humanity, we know, lets us down. We've seen it over and over and over. And every human being has that desire of the ages. We all have the desire. We're born with it. You know, you don't hunger and thirst for something that doesn't exist. Do you realize that? Nobody has a hunger and a thirst for something they don't have a need for. You, you have Hunger, physically, because there's food, right? And your body was designed for what? Food. You have thirst, because water exists. Your body was designed to consume that. A person might have a desire for love, because we were designed for that. But man innately has a desire for God. And if you don't receive God, then you're going to create another God. And so as we consider this fundamental belief, let us consider our deep need to trust and obey. If there is anybody here today who needs to make that commitment to God, if there is a soul here in the Church of Babylon who needs to be baptized, I'm speaking specifically about baptism. If there's anyone here who would like to take, who wants to commit to following God. You've heard the fundamental belief today. You've heard other sermons that come directly from the word of God here in Babylon Church. But you've not made a commitment. If there is any soul like that, I appeal to you to just stand up in courage and boldness the same way that Jesus stood up for you. Stand up now. Any soul that needs to be baptized. If there's any soul here that wants to prepare for baptism, going through the studies, and wants to go into that water just the same way Jesus did. Jesus stood up for us. He was lifted up on the cross. He was humiliated for us. Anyone here want to stand up for Christ? You want to get baptized. If there is a soul here like that, I want to invite you to, to stand up. If there is anyone here like that, and you're thinking about it, and you're pondering about it, maybe you're have, having struggled with that, you don't need to fear. We're, we're all brothers and sisters here. You don't need to be worried about standing up in a church. So if there is anyone that wants to stand up for Christ, I invite you to stand up. Anyone who wants to prepare for baptism, I invite you to stand Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, sister. Somebody standing up for the Lord. Praise the Lord. Standing up for Christ. If there is any other soul that wants to stand up for Christ, please, please remain standing. If there is any other soul here, that wants to take a stand like that for Christ. You want to commit to getting into the boat with Christ. Don't worry and say, I'm not ready. Don't worry and say, I'm not ready. 
You don't have to be perfect to get baptized. None of us here are perfect. Baptism is simply saying, I know, Ron, that's a shock, right? You thought some of us were perfect? <laughs> no, we, we, we're all, we, you're, you're committing, when you're getting baptized, you're committing on going on the journey. And, and, and sanctification is that process of, of growing in Christ. And all of us have to grow in Christ. Amen. So let us, let us pray together. And if, if, if there is any other soul that wants to stand up, let us, let us all pray. Let us, let us bow our heads together and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for when people stand up for you. We thank you, Lord God, for those who, who want to commit to following you, to, to, to believing your word from the very first verse, even though we live in a world that will mock you and make fun of you and say that you believe in old fairy tales and say that you believe in myths. But we know, Lord God, this is your word. And we want to trust your word more than we trust the word of man. That when it comes between the opinion of man and the word of God, we know that you're going to be with us always. Nobody else will. And we may even hurt ourselves, but you'll never hurt us. You'll always love us, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Heavenly Father. And if there is any other soul here, Lord, anyone else here that needs to commit, Lord, and stand up for you, we, we invite them to to stand up to, Lord. We just want to be encouraged, Lord. We all need encouragement as well. And it's always encouragement to see somebody that has received a new heart. And what a blessing it is to see somebody that has received a new mind. Lord God, who has said, I want to turn away from the old life and I want to follow you, Jesus. I've done it the other way and it doesn't work. I want to follow you, Jesus. If there is anyone else like that here today, Lord. We invite them to stand up, and we praise you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord.